All right, we're back here on the Ari Lewis Show here on Israel National Radio, Arut Sheva. And you can find the show on YouTube. Go to YouTube and type in Ari Lewis Show and check out previous episodes. Got a lot of great ones up on there. And if you want to email me, if you have any topics you'd like to discuss in the future, you can email me at Ari Lewis Show at hotmail.com. We have a lot of soccer news to talk about, of course, also known as football. On the line right now is BBC World News Correspondent and freelance writer, Raphael Geller. Raphael, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me, Ari. How are you doing? Hey, doing great. So there is a lot of big soccer news, some big matches. Let's talk about Israel National Football. They have uh, some games against Wales and Belgium, so tell the audience a bit about that. Yeah, basically, we talked about this on your old show, on the other Ari Lewis show. Um, uh, basically, right now, Israel is competing for a spot in the 2016 European Championship, which people say is a, the biggest tournament. Well, it's debatable, but in terms of popularity and you know media coverage, etc., um, the, the European Championship is the biggest soccer tournament in the world after the World Cup, of course. But it's some people even say, not that it's bigger, no one would argue that the, world, that the Euro is bigger than the World Cup, but better teams are in the Euro because, you know, in the World Cup you can have a lot of good teams from, you know, where they're coming from, but not necessarily really quality teams where in this tournament every team that makes it um, is a good team. You know, it's a good European team. Most European teams are, are very talented. Um, so Israel right now is in first place going into these two matches. They're playing against Belgium and Wales, two very, very good teams. Wales is in second place. Belgium's in third. Um, these teams are, on paper, much more talented than is Belgium right now, according to FIFA World Rankings. It's the fourth best team in the world has um, the type of talent that's on. I mean, you could even make an argument the most talented team in the world at every position. They have the, the best goalkeeper in the world. They have the best attacking midfielder in the world. They probably will have the best bench in the world, the type of guys that they can bring up. Uh, from the bench, you know, things aren't working well. It's just unbelievable. Guys that are superstars on their teams are coming off the bench. So Israel has two massive, massive games. Luckily for us, the uh, games are home games. So uh, one will be in Jerusalem in Teddy Stadium. The other will be in uh, Sami Ofer in Haifa, where Israel will be Bosnia. And uh, Israel really needs to get points out of this if they want to have a good chance to qualify uh, for the tournament. If they can't get, I'd say, anywhere between uh, two and four points. Um, they're going to not have, not going to struggle to qualify for the tournament, but they have to be, they have to be able to beat a good, there are two good teams or get two good results if they want to have a real shot at qualifying uh, for the tournament. So that's just kind of a quick synopsis uh, of the two matches. Do you think, wh which is the tougher match for Israel, Wales or Belgium? Well, it's interesting because I think, you know, a lot of people will say, obviously, Belgium is a lot harder. And it is, obviously, on paper. It's a way bigger match. Like, like I just said for the last few minutes, a way better team. But because of that factor, Israel might, I don't want to say blow off Wales, um, but have their, you know, focus, be focusing on Belgium when that could be a big mistake and forget the fact that this Wales team has Gareth Bale, who is, you know, <laughs> maybe one of the five best players in the world. And definitely in terms of money, he got sold for almost 100 million euro to Real Madrid from Tottenham. So he's one of the most you know, expensive players in the history of, of football. If not the most expensive, depends on, you know, which uh, money, which type of transfer you look at. No one really always knows the official amount of money. But uh, it's tricky because Belgium are obviously on paper are a way, way better team than Wales. But at the same time, the Welsh team, it's a very good team. They're in second place. They're doing better than Belgium. They've gotten good results in Belgium. They have two stars, superstars, and Aaron Ramsey and Gareth Bale. Um, and they have a very solid team with guys that play, you know, first division, second division England, um, which right now there's no Israeli in uh, first division England and only one in second division England. So um, when you think about that fact, then these guys are, are playing in good competition every week. They know what it's like to go up against physical big guys. Um, so uh, I don't know. I mean, it, it's really a trick question, but I still go with Belgium just because of everything I said. You know, best goalie in the world, one of the best attacking midfielders, amazing midfield, amazing defense. I mean, every single player on the Belgium starting 11 and the bench plays for the likes of, you know, Manchester City, 
Barcelona, Manchester United, uh, Chelsea, the biggest clubs in the world. So and it's definitely a golden generation for the Belgian team. So uh, that's just uh, it's a tough question, but I'll, I'll go with Belgium by a little bit. All right, at the end of the segment, we'll get your predictions for these two games, but I want to move on to the Israel Premier League. Let's talk about the uh, cup quarters. Karat uh, Shmona, Kabi Bersheva, Kabi Haifa, give us an update on what happened. Uh, well, right now, um, basically, Kiryat Shimona and Maccabi Tel Aviv are, are uh, battling for a spot in the next round in the Cup, and it's unfortunate for soccer fans that one of these teams will be knocked out. Um, at, at this stage, it would have been much, I think, more, better for the league in terms of ratings and interest if these two teams played in the final. That's obviously uh, not going to happen, but right now, uh, the way it works in these Cup games, there's there's um, an aggregate, meaning that you play two games. You play one game at home and one game away. Um, so last night was the first game in the Kiryat Shimon and Maccabi Tel Aviv uh, series. It was supposed to be two weeks ago, but there was a, the massive rainstorm, so it got canceled. Um, Kiryat Shimon and Maccabi drew one-to-one last night, and uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv got an away goal, which is very common to explain, but basically it's, it's equal. It's, more, it's better than getting a, a home goal, if that makes sense. Um, so now next Wednesday, or this upcoming Wednesday, they'll travel to Tel Aviv to face in the second re- uh, leg. It'll be Maccabi at home. Um, and Kiryat Shimone, uh is look, feels pretty positive. I mean, it's important to note in in, in terms of Kiryat Shimone, um, they haven't lost to Maccabi Tel Aviv this year. They've played them three times. They've tied them twice and beat them once. Maccabi Tel Aviv is still looking to get a signature win over one of the – you know, big teams, when I say big, I mean Kiryat Shimon and Bersheva. They still haven't done it this year. Um, and I'm guessing in a couple of minutes we'll get to the actual Israeli league, the Premier League, not the Cup. Um, on the other end of things, um, Apollo Bersheva has a very easy uh, easy draw. They're up against Maccabi Yavna, which is a team in, in the second division. Uh, they, they cruise in the first leg. Um, they're not going to have any issues, you know, advancing uh to the next round. So um, basically, it looks like whoever wins uh, from Maccabi, Tel Aviv, and Kiryat Shimona will end up probably facing uh, Beersheva in the cup final, which will be a very uh, entertaining cup final. It's just unfortunate that uh, Maccabi and Kiryat Shimona have to play each other so early now um, in the cup. Again, you're listening to the Ari Lewis Show here on Arut Sheva, Israel National Radio. And my guest for this segment is BBC World Service News Correspondent Raphael Geller. Raphael, let's switch and talk a little basketball. We've been following Gomico for a while, ever since he's been cut from the NBA. I understand that Maccabi, Tel Aviv, and Jerusalem reached out to what? What is the latest with Gal right now? Basically, uh, these two teams reached out to him. Um, he had a lot of different offers. The media was reporting a lot of different things. Um, and, uh, he signed a contract with, with Ninzi Novograd, a team in the Russian league. A lot of people, a lot of teams in Israel are very, or excuse me, Makavi Tel Aviv and Apollo Jerusalem are very disappointed that, uh, he decided not to come back. Um, but he decided to sign with Ninzi Novograd, which is a team that, um, that it plays in the EuroLeague, plays in the VTB league, which is a league with all the best teams from, uh, that part of Europe, Eastern part of Europe. Um, so he's going to get very good competition. Every single game is going to be hard, unlike in the Israeli league. Um, you know, one week he could play, you know, not not that it's not good teams, but comparing like Maccabi Rishon LeZion and Maccabi Ashdod against, you know, really good teams in the Euro League and the VTB league is, you know, you can't compare it. Every week he's going to get a really good matchup. He's going to have to play really good players against really good players. So um, we'll see what happens there. I mean, it's it's going to be interesting to follow him. Uh, and Lindsay, and the, I think his goal is to come back uh, to the NBA next year if he can have a good season at Lindsay. So, but also, I imagine money was involved. Probably the, he gets a little more money playing in Russia, or was, or was that not a factor at all? Actually, it really wasn't that much of a factor because the other teams were offering him long deals um, oh. in terms of a few like longer deals of more money. He, he money, I don't think was an issue for him at this point. He. He wants to do whatever he can uh, to get back to the NBA. Um, this is, you know, according to his agent, according to him, this is the best way for him to do it, the fastest way for him to do it. And, um, 
yeah, I mean, it, it's a bit surprising because the team kind of came out of nowhere and he was linked with a lot of teams in Jerusalem. Really thought they were going to get him, but this is how it works sometimes. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Going back to Gall, when it didn't work out in the NBA, we know that he has some issues with his visa. I just want to get your thoughts. How much do you think that played a factor in him not ending up in the NBA? I know that he was interested in the Pacers. They were interested in him. He didn't exactly have the whole work visa thing straightened out. How much do you think cost him a job in the NBA? Yeah, I mean, I think it did cost him a job in the NBA, but at the same time, the Pacers throughout uh, the season have had chances to re-sign him. But it's important to note that, and they haven't decided to do it. So, uh, I'm not. Even, yeah, he did sign theoretically, and um, or did agree to sign with the Pacers. Then there was a delay in the visa. What I, I don't think was reported well in, in all the media was that this delay wasn't because he was Israeli. Or it wasn't because of anything like that. It was actually the the fault of his agent who didn't, you know, take the right measures in making sure he has a visa, no matter who, no matter how important. You are, I mean, let's remember that for some people to get visas, it takes, you know, months, if not years. You know, you look at people who work on it for years and months. Um, he was able to get it in a few days, but that he needed it quicker. He needed it quicker, and that just wasn't possible. I mean, to go from getting it, you know, people working, a normal person who's trying to get it, you know, it could take them months to have being a basketball player and getting it in a few days. That's still a big perk. So to expect him to get a visa overnight, it just doesn't work that way. And uh, he should have, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know the full, full details, but he should have uh, thought about that a little bit before. Um, and uh, like I said, though, I mean, he, he, the Pacers had opportunities to sign him later down. They made cuts. Other teams had plenty of opportunities. If you look at NBA edition the last few months, you'll see many, many guards, point guards were added to teams. And he wasn't, so... You can't really, you know, fully blame it on that. Yeah, if you would have had the visa, you probably would have signed with the Pacers, but you never know if he would have stayed with the Pacers. I mean, I think he needs to find a place either where he can get a guaranteed deal or he needs to work on, you know, these once the season starts next year, get a camp invite in the summer and um, and see where it goes. I mean, that's that's really the best he can do at this point. And he's in a very, very good league in Europe right now. Uh, the VTB, the guys I said, very competitive. Every game is really tough. It's not like a normal Spanish league or, or Italian league. And those leagues are very good. But this league is arguably the, the, the best league in the world. Maybe, I guess, besides uh, the Spanish league. Um, but it's different because you're not just playing teams in your country. You're traveling all over Europe. Um, so it's, it's kind of a different atmosphere. You have to fly to every game. Um, so, I don't know. It's, it's more similar if you think about it to the NBA type. A scheduling because it's almost like in the states you go to different states, you know, for different games. Indiana, Minnesota, where here he's going to be going to different countries for games. Uh, apparently, this, his agent thought this was, uh, you know, the thing that get him back. Um, yep. You know, that's that's all I can say. That, that was funny. I mean, I'll tell you, Gall is is young, but I would say at the same time his window to get to the NBA is is pretty small. It probably has a couple of years. And I guess the strategy is give it one more chance, and, and this is the way you can do it by playing the Russian League. Uh, right now he's 26. He's going to turn 27 in about a week. So uh, this is the time for him. If he doesn't make it in a few years, I would hope he comes to the Israeli League and, and gives up on the dream. But, you know, it's obviously his life. Again, this is the Ari Lewis Show here on Arucheva Israel National Radio. And my guest for this segment is BBC World News, News Correspondent Raphael Geller. Rafael, let's go to the Israeli league. Halon has a shocking loss at home by Naharia. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, halon has been on a really good streak. They've been battling for uh, for a top uh, two spot, um, which doesn't look to be uh, realistic right now. It looks like Jerusalem is going to go ahead and grab the two spot, but there's still a lot of time. Uh, Naharia has been, on, uh, been playing really good basketball uh, the last few weeks. And it, it, it was shocking, but Naharia has already beaten – on um, some of the best teams in the league, Paul Jerusalem, Paul Tel Aviv. They played some close games against Maccabi. Uh, they've made a lot of changes when things weren't working out um, at uh, at the beginning of the season. They're the new team that got promoted. So initially their goal was just to make sure that they stay in the league, and now it looks like they're going to be hunting for a playoff spot. And, uh, yeah, it was a big uh, – it was a very big win. And uh, like I said, there's still a lot of more basketball. There's at least um, 
13 games left until the playoffs. There's a whole nother round and two games before that round. So we still have a ways to go, but uh, it was a pretty big win for them and kind of caught Cologne off guard since Cologne had been playing really good the last, you know, six, seven weeks. And uh, we were talking about the previous segment uh, with Josh Hogman. Maccabi Tel Aviv just seems on a roll right now, only two losses throughout the year. Is there any team that really can give them much of a threat in the Israeli league when you get down to the tournament and the championship? As of right now, no. Not the way Jerusalem looks right now. They're, they have a lot of issues in terms of their play down low. Um, their point guard play is also very confusing about who's going to be the guy who gets you assists. Their bench is very weak. They, they lost one of their big men to a to a, a, a season-ending injury. Um, their guards have not been producing the way they thought. There's been rumors that they were going to cut one of their power forwards to bring in someone better. That never happened. Um, so in terms of Jerusalem, they don't seem like the, the type of team that can do it. Um, other teams, Cologne, you know, maybe. Listen, there's a lot of teams that – you have to remember the finals is only two games. It's one game, um, or I, guess, I don't remember if it's home. Yeah, it's home. I don't remember this year if it's home away. But basically, you play two two games. There are teams that can beat Maccabi in one game. The question is, can they beat them um, in two games? Though it's going to be aggregate. So let's say Hapoel Tel Aviv um, wins the first game by ten in the championship, and then Maccabi only win the second game by five. Um, but Paul Tel Aviv would win the championship. So you could technically win the championship with only winning one game. Um, so if you do have an amazing first game against Maccabi and beat them by a good score, I'd say 10 plus points, um, it's possible. I mean, there's hope, but, uh, I don't know. Right now, I don't see it. I think if we talk again in a few weeks, uh, maybe, um, Maybe it'll be possible, but right now they don't seem to have any true uh, threat. It was so funny because at the beginning of this season, just as we had the beginning of last season, the coach was on the hot seat. Maccabi looked in trouble. They lost a couple of games, and I said they'll be fine. And they look better this year than they even did last year, and uh, they'll have another chance to win a European championship. All right, before we let you go, back to Israeli football and back to the mm. national team. They're playing Wales, they're playing Belgium. You broke down the games and talked about how these right. are going to be some tough competitions. But I want to know your prediction. Is Israel going to pull off at least one win here? I, I think Israel will get one win. I, I don't want to predict against it, too. I, I hope, I think realistically, a, a very good thing would be to get one win. So that would be three points out of the six points, three points per win. Um, if they can get a win and a tie, that would be amazing. Um, I don't see them getting two wins. I just don't think it's, you know, we're not at that stage yet. But if we can get a, a win and a tie, that would be uh, fantastic. And um, if we can – and if we – let's say we get two – even if we get two ties, which would only be two points, that still wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. Now, if we lose both games, that will cause a lot of issues. I mean, we'll see, in theory, we'll still be in the hunt for uh, – you know, to, to get maybe a, the second and third spot. But the momentum will be gone. You know, we'll lose. these games are being, you know, given the the, the the label by the media that's, you know, some of the biggest games in Israeli football history. It's going to be sold out, 30-plus thousand people at both games within four days. There's going to be two stadiums in Israel with 30-plus thousand people. That's a big deal in Israel for any sport. So there's a lot of pressure on the team, and we'll, we'll see uh, what happens. And uh, you attended the game that was in Haifa, that was a few months ago, yeah. and, and BB was there, a lot of big celebrities, and um, I know you talked about that on a show on another station, but if you tell, just tell this audience, just so people get an idea, if they can't make it to the game, what type of festive atmosphere that's all about? I mean, it, it's incredible. There's there's thousands, like I said, 30 plus thousand people, um, everyone's singing, everyone's into the game, the national anthem is very powerful at the beginning. You know, remembering that we have our own country and we get to represent the country after everything we've been through. It's a very special thing. A lot, a lot of people are excited to be there. It's, you know, as maybe as sad as it is, this is the first time in a while that the Israel basketball team has really shown that they can win a big, big game. They won the Bosnia game, which was which was a big game, but these games are much, much bigger and they have much, much more at stake. And I think if Israel would have lost the Bosnia game, you wouldn't have sold out. Maybe you would have sold out the stadium um, because because you wanted to see the superstars coming, like Gareth Bale for Wales and all the players on Belgium. But now I think people are actually 
coming to the game because they want to see Israel get a good result, not just because they want to see the you know the opponent come who's a star and get to say, okay, I watched Gareth Bell. They actually want to come and support their team. So um, that's a big deal, and, and I'm excited to see how it goes. All right. Raphael Geller, BBC World News Correspondent, breaking it down here on the Ari Lewis Show out of Ruth Sheva. Raphael, thank you so much, as always, and also thank everyone for listening. Segment one, Sports Rabbi Josh Halkman talking about Maccabi Tel Aviv and David Blue's return. And in segment number two, Raphael Geller talking about Israeli soccer and Israeli basketball as well. Raphael Geller, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Have a good day. You too. Be well, everyone, and have a great day. Take care.